Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, July, July, January 31st, 2019. And this is the weekend charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your presence. This week, obviously, I do want to do a bear market update, but I want to focus a little bit on trends and determining trends and where we are in the current cycle of things. Now, before we do all that, just remember that all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and so last night I was looking for something to read and I'm often guilty of starting a new book instead of a, finishing an old one. And I found in my library a treasure of Wall Street wisdom, which I'm not sure when it was published. I'm looking at it right here. It was $6.95 for a hard copy, which is probably a lot of money back then. Anyway, it was published a long time ago, and there's quite a few people in here. Jesse Livermore, of course, Charles Dow, and quite a few others, including Robert Rear. And I found this book through Linda Rasky, and Linda Story, in her new book, which, is, which isn't out yet. I haven't gotten my copy, my official copy, but I did help her proof it. And she said that when she was a kid, she uh, found this book in her dad's office. And it sounds like her dad wasn't around a lot or there were some issues there, which I, I forget exactly what she said in the book. So I don't want to say too much or you know, over disclose or under disclose or say the wrong thing. But it wasn't like she had her father explain to her what was in the book. She took it upon herself to read this book. And I was kind of thumbing through it last night or sort of just looking around. And I came across Robert Rea. Now, Robert Rea, he's a big Dow theorist. And I haven't fully signed up to Dow Theory, but some of the things they talk about, such as trends, do make a lot of sense. And one problem that you get into, if you start defining too much, then it becomes more and more complicated and you kind of lose sight of where you are. But I was thinking along the lines of higher highs and higher lows. And the reason I'm thinking along these lines is that I'm getting a lot of questions on the market, because so far it has defied gravity. And we're going to get into that in detail in a few minutes, especially when we get into the live charts. But Rhea starts out by saying that an uptrend is a series of higher highs and higher lows. And I know it's kind of a big duh, but sometimes we lose sight of these basics. And as I often say, you know, my wife, you say a lot of the same stuff over and over. It's like, well, I'm going to keep saying the same stuff until you people get it. But people do tend to fight trends. But when you boil it all down, it's just a series of higher highs and higher lows. Now, on the flip side, what's a downtrend? Well, a downtrend is a series of lower lows and lower highs. Now, I know, like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker, everyone knows that. But again, sometimes we lose sight of these things. Now, as long as the big blue arrow is pointing lower or higher, it's all pretty darn obvious. But sometimes it gets a little bit more complicated. And this is where I don't want to get into a bunch of rules. I didn't read the whole chapter from Mr. Rear. I was just looking at what he said about uptrends of higher highs and higher lows. And... There's a little page on his biography, kind of interesting. He had an accident, and he was actually, they used the word invalid. I don't know if you could use that word in today's politically correct nature, but basically, I guess he was bedridden where he ran a lot of his business, which I found quite fascinating. Anyway, it gets a little trickier, and I don't want to get into a whole bunch of rules that I didn't actually read all of those rules, but just use a little common sense where the market is just making a marginal new high like I've drawn in here and then becomes to come in at the least you have to ask yourself is that uptrend coming to an end yes the big blue arrow might still be pointing higher but has the market lost steam also by the definition which I wrote about higher highs and higher lows Back in my first book, back, oh, geez, that's 20 years ago. Wow. 20 years ago is an uptrend. And then 
Mr. Rio wrote about him, I guess, 70 years ago, and then people wrote about that before. So there's really nothing new under the sun, which ironically comes from the Bible, which is older than all this stuff. But anyway, when a market begins to make just a marginal new high and then become, then begins to come back in, and it especially if it takes out that last higher low. So here's a low, here's a higher low, here's a higher low, okay? So when it fails to make much of a higher high and it takes out that prior low, that's when you begin to question things. Now, you don't want to saddle yourself with a whole bunch of rules because then you can end up with analysis paralysis. Just use common sense. Like yesterday we were talking about overbought, oversold, and one lady was was telling me that she uses indicators and and she wanted to, me to kind of give me her blessing to use indicators. And I'm like, yeah, you know, whatever gets you there, but just don't end up with like an analysis paralysis. Use that indicator to kind of help show you the way. And I'm going to show you a few things here, which we've been talking about quite a bit lately when it comes to understanding where we are in the longer term trend by, believe it or not, using some indicators. Now, before we get much, much further, just remember that your net net is your biggest ally. And as I've talked quite before, it's like in a case like this, yeah, the big blue arrow is still pointing higher, but the question mark comes in when you realize that you haven't made any forward progress in quite a while. So as you can see here, big blue arrow pointing higher, but from here to here, and actually if you go from here to here, you've actually lost some steam and you could be in the beginnings of the lower lows and lower highs. So it's pretty darn easy as long as it's going up. What separates the men from the boys is when it starts going sideways and down a little bit, and that's when it gets pretty tougher. Don't confuse brains with a bull market. And also, and I think it was Galakovich, I think it might be his name, he wrote about the fact that a rising market lifts all egos. So a lot of people look pretty smart as long as this market was going up. And then I read somewhere, and it might have been part of what Gann wrote. Gann, from a common sense perspective, when he just talks about some of these common sense rules, makes a hell of a lot of sense. In fact, I actually recommend you read the Orange Book, which is on my website under books, daylander.com slash books dash two dash read but only read about the first 20 pages. When he starts getting into all this esoteric stuff, he gets a little lost. And allegedly, Mr. G Mr. Gann died broke. And I was in Russia speaking, and some guy said, you have MBA, you have degree in computer science. Because I said, I don't get Gann. Somebody asked me about Gann, I'm like, I don't get Gann. You have degree in computer science, you have MBA. How could you not get Gann? I'm like, oh crap, you know, I'm being heckled. <laughs> Come all the way to Russia be heckled and i didn't think of a good comeback right away you know like two days later you're like oh man i gotta come back <laughs> well my comeback should have been mr gan died broke so mr gan didn't get mr gan either but i will say this if you and you could probably get them online and i have them somewhere and i've i've talked about them before i believe he has some rules for trading and they make a lot of sense and but just don't get into all those angles and lines and all that other stuff. You draw enough lines on a chart and it's always going to be at some sort of inflection point. You get yourself in a lot of trouble. Anyway, before I digress too far, the point is it gets a little bit more complicated when that big blue arrow becomes a smaller blue arrow trading sideways to possibly lower. You have to begin to ask yourself, are you in a market of lower lows and lower highs? And by the way, and when we get to the live charts, maybe I could show this a little bit more. There will be some lag in all this. I plotted a zigzag indicator earlier today in attempts to kind of have that dovetail into my TFM 10% system, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And the thing about the zigzag that you got to be really careful about is the, the last leg is going to be in hindsight. You don't know ahead of time. So you're looking at the hard right edge of the chart. And you can't look back to that last leg like it was, it's was. it been there for a month. It hasn't been there for a month or two months or three months or whatever. 
it just was by taking today's data and looking back in time. And that'll make a little more sense when we get to the charts too. Now, if we take a look at the current S&P 500, you could see that we made a marginal new high and then we had a bit of, let's call it a TKO type of move or a pullback, whatever you want to call it. But you could see this is a weekly chart. And then obviously going pretty far back, we're making higher highs and higher lows, okay? All the way up until, let's say, this point here. So that's pretty obvious. Now, but Dave, it's obvious in hindsight. Well, it's obvious in hindsight, but it's also obvious once you get a few of these going, you can say, okay, let's see. Looks like so far we're doing okay, right? Now, you get this weekly trend knockout type of move, which is a still a higher low. And then you say, like, okay, well, maybe this is just a knockout move going to knock some people out. And aha, it triggers right here. And then wait a minute, comes back down. And then it goes on to make new highs. So it's like, okay, well, so far we're still in pretty good shape. The problem becomes is when you begin to, the problem becomes when you take, begin to take out those prior lows. And then it can become a series of lower lows. Okay. So now we have what? We have a thrust lower. And so far we have a pullback. Okay. Now there's other ways that, other things I'm looking at too, but I just want to kind of break it all down in a real simple form. And again, this is where this is where it gets kind of tough. Now, if we start doing this, then it's like, okay, well, we're definitely at a downtrend, and that's the way to play. By the way, even if you do get pretty bearish, it doesn't mean that you won't still buy stocks. You'll just become more and more selective. I'm long quite a few stocks right now. And I'm still kind of bearish. Well, I like the setups. And we'll kind of skirt around that in a minute and talk about that, I should say. So here we have, we have one thrust down and we have one pullback. Now, again, we don't know if that's going to be thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, rinse and repeat. But we do know a few things. We know the market hasn't done much in a year. Okay? Let's speak like Tarzan for a little while. Okay, just a Tarzan market. You know, Tarzan probably be a pretty good trader in Tarzan speak. And you probably wonder, what the hell is he talking about? If I get my pen to work. Here we go. So back here, this good, right? In Tarzan speak. But where we are now, this bad in Tarzan speak. Okay. Why? Well, it always comes back that to the net net. Where are we? Around 2700 And where are we? Where were we back in? November, December of 2018, around 2,700. All right, so that's a year and change of no forward progress. So at the least, you're going to have to draw a sideways arrow. So don't overcomplicate things. Just use a little common sense when it comes to the markets and realize that an uptrend is a series of higher highs and higher lows. I know, duh. And a downtrend is a series of lower lows and lower highs. Now, it's all going to look obvious in hindsight. And in some cases, like I said earlier, something like zigzag is pretty much in hindsight. But once that trend gets established, you know where you are. And you could use some indicators, provided that you use them sparingly, to show you where you are. Let me see if I can fix this a little bit. Okay, here we go. So let's take a look at some indicators. Well, before we even get started here, notice I have the 50-day moving average drawn. Now, before we get into talking about the TFM system and things like that, just notice the slope of the 50-day moving average, 50-week moving average in this case. I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but right here it says W for weekly. Is up. Right here, the slope is kind of flat, kind of still flat here. And then right here, the slope is up. And right here, the slope is kind of down, and now it's kind of flat. So very simple indicator, the slope of the moving average. I know. Well, the other thing, we have Landry Light. Well, you go all the way back to 2013, and you had Landry Light for a long, 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 long time. I kind of feel like that little, the little man on uh, 
what's the prices right? You know, just kind of going up and up and up. And I guess over here, it's kind of like, before we digress too far, right here, you no longer had Landry Light. Wasn't the end of the world, though. Turns out that was just a pullback. And then you had Landry Light again through here. You had a little bit on the downside here, and then you had quite a bit on the downside here. Now, this was nothing to sneeze at. You buy and hold people, buy and hope people held through that. But even in hindsight, if I'd have held through that, I have violated so many rules, especially on individual stock bases. You probably would have gotten knocked out of everything. And if you guys remember, we did start shorting quite a bit in 2016. And believe it or not, we made a little bit of money and then the market resumed its longer term uptrend. But again, getting back to the Landry light, you can see we had a little bit here and slope of the moving average kind of flat here. But slope begins to turn up here. And then we had Landry light for a long, 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 long time. 2016, 2017, oop, almost, almost, almost. We had our first little kiss of the moving average right there. Then we resumed our Landry light. So Stupid little simple indicator like that can give you a lot of perspective. Now, don't start adding indicator after indicator after indicator, but you could use a few things to kind of let you know where you are. I don't want to digress too far, but you start drawing a lot of those, if you want to call it down Dow theory uh, waves, that's, that's fine, or legs. But if you start doing a lot of that research before long, it starts looking like a, a lot like Elliott wave. And I think where people get into trouble with Elliott Wave, as I preach quite often, is not when the Elliott Wave agrees with the trend, because what? Everything works better with trend. Stop me if you heard that before. But where the Elliott Wave people get into trouble is when their Elliott Wave says the trend should be going one way and the actual trend is going the other. What is, is. The bullish and bearish ribbons that I have down here are not actually based on the Landry light, which we just talked about. I just want to show you the Landry light in here and how it can keep you on the right side of the market. The bullish and bearish ribbons that I programmed in are basically saying that as long as this market is within 10%, and this is the 10% line right here, so anything in here, as long as it's within 10% of its 50-week moving, moving average, I'm going to consider the market bullish, and I'm also going to draw a big blue arrow. In this case, it's red, but it should be blue, saying that we're in an uptrend. Now, the ribbon also says, well, wait a minute, because the TFM system says if we go more than 10% away from the 50-week high and close below the 50-week moving average, then we're going to switch over to bear mode. If there's something in between where, let's say, the moving average intersects the 50-week moving average. You don't have that upside Landry light. Then we're going to switch over to neutral mode. So notice that 2013, we were bullish for a long, 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 long time. And then market had a little bit of a test. We went to neutral based on this particular system. We went back to bullish for about a year or so. And this is kind of like a little caution light right here. Things started looking a little bit better, turned back green, and then turned back to neutral, and then began to turn red again. Now, as you've seen me preach quite a bit, this period of time in the market was a substantial sell-off. And what, what I've been preaching, I forget the exact numbers, but I think the Russell 2000 from a weekly bow tie sold off about 18%. That's nothing to sneeze at. So it was fairly ugly market. Also, we did have some sell signals in the S&P and some other indices, or I guess the NASDAQ too. And those spills were pretty serious, serious enough for us to end up short quite a few stocks. Well, the database also had us short quite a few stocks too. Now, you could see that the market began to rally again. Once it starts making new highs and starts climbing higher, what happens? Well, you become, or the indicator becomes less than 10%. Even right here in that little spill we had back in 2018, we were still less than 10% of 
away from the 50 week high. And then all of a sudden the market comes down to the 50 week moving average. It goes neutral. And then right here, I think we get a sell signal in the system fairly early in, the, in this process. And then now obviously we're retracing back up a little bit. We don't have a buy by the way, because we're looking at a 50 week moving average as our whipsaw filter. And on the downside, let's say this is a 50 week moving average. On the downside, we're simply just looking for a close below that moving average because we don't want to sit around and wait for Landry light. By the time we wait for Landry light, it might be too late. But on the upside, we want a little bit more confirmation. So we want one, two weeks of Landry light above. Now, as I preach, and I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse on this too, you got to be really careful when you put these whipsaw, filter, whipsaw filters in here and keep them real simple. Now, I'm not trying to develop a complete market timing system in and of itself. I just occasionally like to come up with something simple, so ridiculously simple that I myself cannot believe that it actually works. And in a case like this, it's like, well, we're going to – stay long as long as the market is near new highs and we're going to stay short or out of the market when it is a certain distance away from those new highs. 10% seems to work in the indices. By the way, people get real confused really fast. I'm getting emails from people all over the world, which is kind of exciting, but they're like, hey, I'm looking at the stock and it's got a TFM 10% signal. It's like, no, no, it, it's based on the volatility of the market. I just happen to pick 10% in the indices because one it's a good round number and it's about right if you look at the volatility of an index 10 percent is a pretty sizable move well 10 percent in a little biotech or a weed stock is not that big of a deal that might happen in one afternoon we're gonna look at i think it's a biotech in a minute that's already moved 10 percent today now, again, don't overuse and misuse indicators, but if that indicator can help to illustrate what's actually happening, it can certainly help you out. So if we look at a, and this is a daily chart, we look down here, it's a daily chart. This is Metastock, by the way. And all of these indicators are free with Metastock. If you get the newest version, you will get them free. Sign up through me if you don't mind. I need to find the, uh, I have the link somewhere. And maybe when I edit this video, I'll put the link in. But you can see on a daily basis, we had a bow tie here. And this is the mechanical system, which I had programmed in, the program over at Metastock did. And this day here, you actually had the bow tie down, which means that these moving averages crossed over fairly quickly and then begin to spread out in the other direction. Notice that your ribbon down here, again, something incredibly simple. If the 10 is greater than the 20 exponential, the 10 is simple, the 20 is exponential, 30 is exponential. This is what I call uptrend proper order. So I had them program in a little ribbon down here to say, hey, they're in uptrend proper order. And if the 10 is less than the 20 and the 20 is less than the 30, then this is going to be downtrend proper order, okay? And then you can see a couple cases in here. We did kind of cross back and forth, at least with that 10-day moving average, where if you want to call it neutral, that's fine. Let's just call that neutral. And then now, believe it or not, on a daily basis, these moving averages have turned back up. Now, I wouldn't consider this a buy because we're still at really high levels. And it's also kind of sloppily formed, sloppily if that's a word, because you can see the cross took, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It took about 12 days to cross over. So that's a couple of weeks and change on a daily chart. But the point I'm making here is something as simple as the order of the moving averages, the slope of the moving averages, and a simple little system like bow ties can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Now, I'm a huge fan of the weekly bow tie. And again, we could use some simple indicators like the TFM 10% system, 
or bow ties, especially on a weekly basis to help keep us on the right side of the market. Now, I've showed the chart so many times. People ask me to stop showing it. But if you go back and look at 2000, 2009, and shit, I guess where we are now. Oops, I just demonetized my video. I have to bleep that out. <laughs> But we had sell signals here and sell and buy signals here. And now we have a weekly sell signal. What's interesting is, and I didn't realize this until we went live, but this sell signal here, and again, this is mechanical sell system based on how it was programmed in the meta stock. But based on this sell signal here, we still haven't triggered that bow tie down. So that's kind of interesting. Now, for me to get excited about this market, and I'll kind of drive this point home in a few other ways, it would actually have to come up here and start making new highs, okay, before I begin to get too excited about this market. If we had to draw in those higher highs and higher lows, well, I would draw this leg like this and this leg like this. Now, as I was kind of alluding to earlier, this leg might not be finished. We don't know that this leg is finished. So if we were drawing a zigzag or something like that, it would look like that, oh, well, this leg started right here. Well, you don't know that it started right here until you come way up here and draw it going backwards, okay? So be careful if you ever look at some kind of indicator that has requires a lot of hindsight to plot it. But it could still be useful nonetheless. So, so far on a weekly basis, it looks like the market is in trouble. But Dave, you long a lot of stock. Why is that? Well, because I'm getting setups. I'm seeing some speculative issues setting up. And my phone was lighting up this morning with a bunch of weed stocks. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Now, getting back to the daily chart, here's my issue or some of my issues with the overall market. Yes, it's going up, okay? And I'm not going to argue with that. And again, I've the database has gotten me long some stocks. And let's see how it shakes out. I hope the market goes up forever. But I am still a little bearish in here. One reason is because it's overbought. And how do you gauge overbought? Well, I did a presentation yesterday in the Q&A where I talked a lot about overbought. And I'll have that posted soon. I'll have it posted probably by tomorrow, I hope. But the point is, the market rallied. I forget how much from there to there. We can measure it when we get to the live charts. But it was quite a bit. I think it was 10.56%, and now it's probably 11%. And my point was, in looking at the S&P going back 10 years or so, there's only been a few years where it rallied more than 10%. And obviously, we had a few negative years over the last 10 years, believe it or not. I know it's hard to believe, right? Market just goes up longer term, right? Who well, no, knows? It's went down a few years. Last year was negative, for instance. So that right there tells you just a net-net price move, it's overbought. Now, it's really hard for a market, overbought can always become more over, overbought, but it's really hard for an overbought market to mount a new leg on top of an overbought market. Now, you have to kind of frame that with what is is. The market can do whatever it freaking wants, okay? But my thinking is it's going to be really hard for this market to rally another 10, 11%. And on top of that, we've got quite a bit of overhead supply. Now, when I woke up this morning, I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about. And I started going through dozens and dozens and dozens of old presentations. And one of the things I was thinking about talking about was the psychology of reading the charts. Now, If you think about technical analysis and not some mumbo jumbo like wave counting or something like that, if you think about technical analysis in general, what is our job as a technician? Well, we have two jobs. We have a job as a technician and a job as a trader. Our job as a technician, technician is to read the mind of the market through the charts. So what is the market telling us now? Now, also, by the way, I also am a huge fan of man on the street. When my phone starts lighting up, I know, from friends that is, I know that the market 
has begun to affect people's psyche. I've kind of warned people before, and like, ah, I looked at my statements, they don't look too bad. It's like, well, how old is your statement? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I've no longer taken it upon myself to try to help people ahead of time because it's kind of a lost cause. And people get mad at me if I say I'm embarrassed. So it's like I just I try not to talk about the markets too much. But once my phone starts lighting up, I know the man on the streets beginning to panic. And I know down here my phone was lighting up quite a bit. So I know that man on the streets beginning to panic. And a lot of times that's a microcosm for what's going on. Well, now the markets rally back up. So what are they thinking? Okay, what do you think they're thinking? Well, they're probably thinking I dodged a bullet. And and in some cases, if they did get out, they're probably thinking, well, maybe I need to get back in. Okay. So if this market begins to roll back over, they're going to be like, oh, goodness gracious. They probably say something worse than that. Maybe I need a GTFO because I don't want to watch my retirement vanish in front of my eyes. Also, anybody who held on through this might be looking to get out of break even. But so far, the, that hasn't happened. And that's because so far the market is going higher. So technical analysis does not have to be a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo. You're just reading the mind of the market. And as I've said, a nauseam neighbor called me about GE, and I forget the exact prices, but it was down around double digits. And it had a huge mound of overhead supply above the market, a couple of points above it. I think it was like at 18 or 19 or something. And a neighbor was like, I'm thinking about buying some GE. I'm like, well... I don't know if I would do that because there's a big wad of trading right above where you are. And I said around 19 or whatever the price was. I forget exactly. I can look at a chart and tell you. Anyway, he's like, well, I bought it there. It's like, so he had already bought the stock. He was looking to average down. And it just tells me that human nature is human nature. And we read that human nature through the charts. All right, any questions on any of that? I know I kind of just gave you a little thumbnail on a couple little ways to time the market or look at the market and figure out where we are. But the bottom line is don't overthink it. Okay, in yesterday's Q&A, somebody asked me about QTT, and the reason they were asking me about it was because the stock triggered – at 950 immediately shot up to like 975 and I was starting to feel like a genius and then it came right back in and closed below 950 so he wanted to know how I played it now like I said yesterday I'm just gonna give you a little thumbnail of what happened but yesterday the point I was making is I don't want to report every one of my trades, but I'll tell you this. If I recommend something directly, I work as hard as possible to make sure I mimic exactly what I say. But I will use a little discretion if you have like a crazy fast move on the open. So here's the stock opening down here. And let's just say the first couple of trades, you have trades that look something like this. In the first minute of trading, and like trades like here and then here and here. Well, within the first few seconds or first minute of trading, I might pass on that trade because that's a fast move on the open. It might not be a real move. But in a case like this, you can see it kind of opened up a little bit, but not too much. Kind of meandered, then kind of began to rally and rally and rally and rally. So this is far enough into the process to where it's like, okay, now... I could put my order in, and I almost missed it, truth be told, because I, I wasn't paying careful attention to get my orders in at any time. But I did get my stop order in probably somewhere around here, and I placed it for 950. It triggered here. And then in another account, I actually bought the market, and I think I got in at like 951. So it was like a quick trigger and quick jumping in the market. Now, unfortunately, it within a few minutes, it looked felt pretty good, looked and felt pretty good. I started counting my money. Big mistake. FYI. <laughs> I always laugh when I hear FYI. My 
one of my mother-in-law's friends got the internet a while back and <laughs> sometimes these older people, they get the internet, they get all excited and she starts sending me all these things, you know, people in Walmart are hiding under cars and cutting your, cutting your Achilles heels. Like, no, they're not. <laughs> so I told her, FYI, you can go to Snopes or someplace and check things out. She got all pissed off. FYI, what does that mean? She thought I was telling her something. Anyway, so that's why I say FYI like that. <laughs> Sometimes I tell my wife, FYI. And I think she knows what I'm implying. Anyway, the entry was here, 950. And yeah, it shot back up, shot up quickly after. They came right back in. Well, you know, that's that's life. That's trading. I know, easier said than done. I did drop an F-bomb, and I put an F-bomb in my F-bomb journal, which I now just call my trading journal. So, yeah, it did trigger come back in, but if you squint your eyes, and especially if you back this chart out even further, your entry was right here. It's just right here. Yeah, it went up a little bit. And here's the deal. If I had just let that stop triggering, I'm busy doing a webinar or something, and it gets stopped into a stock, I wouldn't have even bother dropping an F-bomb when it's a little move higher. At the end of the day, it's like, ah, yeah, it rallied up a little bit, came back in, so what? So you got to be really careful when you try to pick apart everything and say, well, maybe I shouldn't have gotten a trade. And this is where you get into a lot of trouble if you try to make too many decisions. Yes, use a little bit of discretion, but don't make a whole lot of decisions. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because today, knock on wood, so far, it's taken off. Looks like it's backed off a little bit. But you can see if you were to kind of overthink this thing, and say, well, wait a minute. Okay, let me just see what happens. Oh, it's rallying. I better get in, better get in, better get in. And then it comes back in, and you're like, whew, dodged a bullet. You would have missed out on a trade. Or worse, what if you finally, as the gentleman pointed out, Chris pointed out, if it got up to like 975 and you realized you did not take that trade, so you throw in the towel because of fear of missing out, and then all of a sudden now you're faced with a half a point loss. Then you just say, oh, that was stupid. Let me just get out. And then, of course, the next couple of days begins to take off without you. So just a lesson in following the plan, even though and quite often it, all, it won't always work in your favor. And again, let's not start kissing each other just yet, but let's just see what happens. Ideally, well... I should say, let me just rewind. I, I don't really, I try to get too excited about positions until unless they hit the initial profit target. I got my stock at break even, so I know I'm able to lock something in. Now, one of the things I thought about a lot this morning, but I've covered it so many times, I felt like, well, I'm not going to beat the dead horse again today on this. And especially in going through all my old presentations, I found quite a few where I talked about patience. It was kind of funny. It's like <laughs> I, I did a webinar on patience, and then I realized that the week before I was a webinar on patience. But the bottom line is the only three things that you're really going to need to trade are patience, patience, and patience. And I'm seeing the theme play out once again. And this is why I put together this learning management system, even though it's as some of you have pointed out, and, and I fully agree, there is some repetition in there. And I don't have the quote in front of you. I saw a really good quote about repetition last night. But basically, I'm going to keep saying these things until you people get it. But what pains me the most is people hang in there, hang in there, hang in there, hang in there. They get frustrated. They go off to do whatever. And then, of course, the market takes out off without them. As I've said quite a bit, and I think I actually said it in yesterday's webinar too, I had a client who was trading the service and he didn't quit the service, but he said, eh, I'm just going to quit for a little while, take a break. And he waited a couple of weeks and then he decided to start trading again. And when he pulled up the portfolio, he said he feels like he broke up with his fiance and the next Saturday night she won the lottery, the Powerball, I think is what he actually said. 
because we had a whole bunch of big winners. And that's the thing that pains me the most. And I think that's why I'm going to work harder to get this learning management system working and to get people through this system and get them up to speed and make them good traders as opposed to giving them the fish. Now, I'm going to keep doing my trading service because it forces me to work even harder than I probably would have because, as I've said, ad nauseum, there was a time where someone said, hey, I'm just going to take a pause for a little while, kind of like the aforementioned gentleman, because he couldn't see where there would be any new setups in the near future. And quite frankly, neither could I. Now, if I wasn't doing the service, I probably would have went home and not did a careful, thorough analysis. But because I'm doing the service and maybe to some extent, maybe feel a little bit pressure, like I should work a little harder. Maybe there's got to be something out there. I found two of the biggest setups for the year. Now, I know I've kind of beat the dead horse in that story. So some random thoughts on this. I think we're getting close to knocking a few out the park. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, the trend following was chip away, chip away, chip away, chip away, and then bam, you knock a couple out of the park. I think it was Drunken Miller that said the secret to trading is preservation of capital and home runs. Most people quit before they get to the home runs, and I see this over and over, and it pains me to see that, and that's got me thinking that I need to work even harder and beating that dead horse on patience and all these other things. And that's where all that go. That's all that energy gets focused into the learning management system to get everybody up to speed. Now, one thing that I was thinking about this morning is you have to trade where the trend is. Well, somebody emailed me a couple of days ago and said, well, I'm going to quit the service because I don't like speculative issues, and I'm not a huge fan of IPOs. Well, that's where the trend is, and the reason I think we're getting close to hitting a few out the park is because I'm getting those type of emails. Well, Dave, I don't like to short, and it seems like we could have a lot of shorts in here. It's like, well, you have to take what the market's giving you, and as I've said quite often, and I also talked about this, Last week at Bandcamp, when I was in St. Lucia, talking to Charlie Kirk's people, it's like people take a snapshot of my portfolio, and it's like the blind men feeling up on the elephant. I guess you can't say feeling up in this politically correct day and age, right? <laughs> Did they have the elephant's permission? I don't know. Anyway, one's going to fill a leg and think it's a tree trunk. Okay, one's gonna fill the trunk and think it's a rope or the tail, or whatever. I'm not sure what they think the, the trunk is, maybe a vine. Anyway, you kind of get the idea. Feel the side of it, feel the wall. So people look at my portfolio, go back to 2060. Well, this guy just shards banks and insurance companies. Big cap stock. He's a big cap trader. I want small speculative issues, you know. You look at that portfolio now. And it's like, well, he trades a lot of these speculative issues, and he's got some weed stocks in there and things like that. So I'm just willing to go where the trend is and willing to go where the opportunity is, long, short, or sometimes sit in your hand. So like I said, one guy's going to tap the brakes, stop trading because he doesn't like the volatile stocks or the speculative stocks. Well, I've given this lecture quite a bit. Volatile stocks are risky, but we adjust for that volatility through share size. And as I preach, something bad can always happen in a lower volatility stock. And I even showed a spreadsheet where you'd be trading more shares in a bigger cap stock, which provided, of course, it's lower in volatility. And if you get whacked, it could really do some detriment to your portfolio. Now, the example I used... I believe was with a bigger cap stock. And let's say you had, a, I think it was like a two point stop. I forget what it was. But anyway, you ended up with 88% of your portfolio in this one stock. And if that stock got whacked overnight, 
And trust me, it can happen. And, you know, the CEO might go on a podcast and smoke some weed and drink some whiskey <laughs> or something stupid like that. Or he might fondle his secretary, as we've talked about quite a bit. So it doesn't have to be something drastic with the company, like the company's killing people or whatever. It could be something really simple and stupid based on human nature. Now, yeah, that little biotech or IPO might get whacked pretty hard, but if you have a smaller share size, and I forget the math I was showing, I think it was showing a 50% haircut, you get whacked about 10% in the, in the example I use, which is going to suck, okay? But you can live to fight another day. If you lose 88% of your account, or I should say 44% of your account, I think the example I used, nearly half of your account, eh, you're going to be pretty demoralized. So you have to trade where the action is, and you have to be willing to trade more risky stocks when that's what the market is serving up, adjusting for volatility, of course. And when the market's kind of questionable, I think you have to short. Now, if I never had to short again in my life, I would be very happy. But as I often say, it's a necessary evil for two reasons. One, it's the only way to make money if the market goes down. And two, it's going to help teach you how to trade. So it helps you to see both sides of the market. I don't want to go off on a tangent on this about people who only go long, et cetera. But just know that if you do short, your chart reading is going to become much, 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 much better because you're not looking for just one side. If you just look for one thing, your selective perception and perceptual distortion will kick in. And I wasn't going to use this example, but I, I was going to use an example for something else. But I think it makes a good example for this, too. When my daughter was a little younger, somebody, I guess, babysat her or whatever, and they played a game called Yellow Car. And... Next time you get out in your car or wherever, if you live on a busy street, start counting yellow cars, you know? So you're only you're gonna be surprised at how many yellow cars there are out there. And I was gonna actually use it as a positive because I'm looking for certain things in trading psychology and the micro versus the macro and all that. And I find that it's just sort of coming to me from all these different angles, and it's kind of exciting and fun to put these presentations together from that. And I'm working on a few pieces such as the acrasia, et cetera. But anyway, long story endless, I think that if you only look at the long side, you're, you're going to make that story fit. Whereas if you're willing to go long and short, you're like, all right, is Mark going up or down? Well, it might be going sideways too, but at least you'll see both sides of the market. Now you also can't confuse the issue with facts. Those little thin er biotechs or whatever IPOs or speculative issues, they might not have any legitimacy to them whatsoever. But if they're trending and they're looking good, maybe the promise of the future will pan out. Pan out. Who knows? Okay. So don't confuse the issue with the facts. They're going up. They're going up. Now this is something I thought about. Right as I was going live today, somebody, I'm not going to say who it is, but somebody was protesting weed stocks. And I almost wrote, go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> Said, I will never interview a, a CEO of a weed company or whatever. And I'm like, okay, whatever is what I say. You have to trade where the action is. Don't. Confuse your moral compass with your trading. Years ago, a friend of mine joked. He's an Indian guy. I don't know why he talks like this, though, but uh, he once told somebody, if they've, if they've heard that, that intravenous drug use was on the rise, he would buy hypodermic, hypodermic needles. Well, I'm not that bad. It, drug use isn't on the rise, is it? Anyway, I think you have to have a trend compass, not a moral one. I don't have the time to bother. But I'd be willing to bet if you did a little research, do some research into these moral 
mutual funds that won't invest in certain industries or certain things. And I'd be willing to bet that they underperform the rest of them. So you can't confuse the issue with facts. You've got to have a, a trend compass and not a moral one. My phone was lighting up this morning with some of these weed stocks, some of these very speculative ones. And we'll see how it shakes out, but they might be something there. And as a trend follower, or more specifically, a trend following moron, then I'm going to buy them. Weed stocks will go up in smoke. <laughs> I'm hungry for weed stocks. All right. Any questions or thoughts or anything else? If you get a chance, and if you don't have a chance, do it anyway. Damn it. <laughs> if you look at my home page, it should be a little banner ad. If not, look around or just go to members area and join the members site. You can get started for free. And right now, I think it's a good time to watch the market timing course. A lot of things we talked about today in a lot more detail. I would ask you to do that, and I think that it will help you out. What I did was I took a lot of the market timing out of the members area, out of the paid members area, and made a market timing course a few months back. And the reason I did this was I think it was very timely since the market was in the process of rolling over. And if the market does not roll over this time, or continue to roll over, I should say, then so what? At least you now have that knowledge. All right, let's, let me shift gears here and let's get into the chart. Start at, if you guys wanna start asking about individual stock picks, feel free to do so now. Okay, Frenchie says, I've got to fix this one thing, one second. Okay, Frenchie says, I just watched a report on ESG funds, environmental, social, government funds. They are starting to do well. Okay, um, do you have any tickers for me? Or is this something that ESG funds... Oh, here we go. Let's see. ESG select. Yeah, give me some tickers if you have them. Is this ESG? Well, that looks like the market itself. I mean, it's doing well lately. It looks like the overall market. Yeah, give me some tickers, Frenchie. We'll check it out. No idea. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying that they can't do well here and there, but I think longer term, I think anything you do to limit yourself is going to hurt you longer term. Any any rules you put in place, so I can't do this or I can't do that, I think it's going to hurt you longer term. Now, let's say you can't short in your fund, and as I often say, the problem with that is, you're going to have an upside bias, whether you, whether the market's going up or not. Let's take a look at just a couple of things. We already kind of beat the market to death here. Let's take a look at the indices and where we are now. And again, so far, especially if we look at a weekly, I just think that we're in the early phase of rolling over. But hey, this market goes on to make new highs then I'm not going to fight it, okay? Now, how far away are we from new highs? We are less than 8% away from all-time highs. Now, as a general statement, I'm not going to rush out and buy this market just yet for me to start to get bullish. And that's the thing, too. I think that what people lose sight of is if you have some sort of – if you're looking at the markets, you try to figure out they're going up, down, and sideways, and, of course, you're using net-net. But make sure you just have some sort of framework that you work around. So my framework is, let's go back to a daily. My framework is we got a lot of overhead resistance, or we have a lot of over, overhead resistance, I guess, to be a little bit more correct to get through. And we're also very overbought, like I just said. So these two things are sort of keeping me out of this market from a general standpoint. Now I am seeing some speculative issues, okay? that are worth trading, that I have bought. 
Okay. I think that they could trade higher even if the market begins to trade lower. But for me to buy a generic stock or general stock in general, I should say, a big cap stock, just because the market's going up, I buy the overall market just because it's going up, I have a bit of a problem with that. By the way, I think the big opportunity would be if we come in tomorrow or some other day and we have a huge gap open way up here, I think it could be the mother of all shorting opportunities. But be careful because obviously this has been quite the trend in here. And I was wondering what happened yesterday. And by accident, I saw that the Fed made some announcements or did something. So it looks like the Fed's trying to step on the gas a little bit and push this market higher. Kind of interesting. But again, longer term, weekly basis, I think we still could be in trouble. But so far, the market doesn't care what I think. Okay. NASDAQ composite, decent day today so far. Cutting through that overhead supply like butter. For me to get excited about the market, I have to go on to do what? Make some new highs and stay there. Same thing in the Russell 2000, just pushing into this overhead supply. But so far, especially on a weekly basis, we got a big old thrust down followed by this retrace. That still looks pretty ugly to me, okay? Lower lows and lower highs, okay? So we got the lower highs, step one. We got the lower lows, step two. So now let's see if the next leg begins to pan out. But in the meantime, I'm not seeing a whole lot of shorts. Why? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, three, you know, 20-something up days. And on the short side, I it, ideally, I like to see a short trigger within the first couple of days, okay? And so I'm no longer seeing that many shorts setting up. And I'm actually seeing a few, again, speculative issues setting up here and there and moving higher. Frenchie says, I have no problem with weed stocks. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're going up, they're going up. All right, as far as the sector action, a lot of the sector action looks like the overall market itself. Big retraces up until up into uh, overhead supply. As a general statement, they are improving. Some areas like banks have gone kind of straight up in here. They cut through this resistance, but now they have another water resistance. So I'm just having a hard time getting excited about something like the banks. Insurance kind of looks like the overall market itself, almost through all the overhead supply. But what's the problem here? Well, kind of hard to mount a brand new leg on top of that old leg, okay? It's kind of like you might be the greatest runner in the world, but it's kind of hard to run a marathon after you just got through running a marathon, okay? And I think the real estate's the poster child for that, okay? So, so far, it's shot higher, but can this keep going higher? I don't know. I think it's going to have a hard time doing that. Anyway, so you kind of get the idea what's going on. Market definitely improving shorter term. Really looking pretty good. The shorter term, I mean, just you know, throw a dart at some of these sectors, and you can see transports. Look at that. Nice run higher. Still has a lot of work cut out for it, though, okay? All right, GTX, GTX. Yeah, I like this one. This is actually in my Landry list. I, I wanted a little bit more pullback, though, okay? I would prefer it if it pulled back a little further, a little bit more knockout type of move. Um, these IPOs, sometimes they, they, they're they priced too high and they die or they came they come public too early. They implode, they get to act together, then they begin to rally and take off. You get these cup and handles, you get these, you know, take a look at QTT, for instance. You get something like that, which is just a beautiful, beautiful setup. You've got this nice thrust higher, followed by this knockout move. That's looking pretty good. I don't know, is HUYA an IPO or was an IPO? HUYA. Yeah, HUYA. Let's see what's happening here. Yeah, see, that was an IPO, shot up, came back in, and now it's kind of bottoming out. Take it off again. We're long this one, FYI. <laughs> and so far, so good. Looks kind of interesting. By the way, if you want to take that on as a new position, I think it looks pretty good still. And I'm not, of course, I'm a little biased. But it's kind of like a double top knockout looking type of pattern. And I'm sure it's a bow tie. Yeah, it's also, look at that beautiful bow tie. Bow ties here, thrust a little higher. Still kind of get these back together, but looks pretty good. All right, mRNA. 
the problem with mRNA is it just came all the way back down. So I really don't have any structure or there's no structure here for me to get excited about. However, if this thing goes on to make new closing highs, I think I would reevaluate it and possibly consider going long. Okay. But it retraced so far down and almost started making brand new lows. So yeah, today's having a pretty good day today. But if it keeps, if it can keep on keeping on, then let's maybe take a look at it for a pullback or something. UCTT, UCTT. Yeah, it looks good. As far as trends are concerned, okay? So we've got a kind of a nice trend here, higher, right? So far, at least. What happened here, you know, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, okay? So now you're to a point where, wait a minute, this might be a new leg higher. So on the next pullback, absolutely. It does have some little resistance along the way to deal with, but it doesn't look too horrible, okay? So let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at the bow tie. It's not exactly a bow tie, but sort of bow tie-ish. The last on S&P for 10 bars arrow greater than 1050 MA. SP, I'm not sure what you're saying. SPX. Okay, let's do a. Okay, let's see what he's saying. Let's put in a 50 week or 50 day moving average. All right, that's a 50 day moving average. You want to talk about a weekly? Well, we're not above the 50 week moving average yet. And by the way, what was I just saying? Slope of the moving average, okay? The slope of the 50-day, 50-week moving average has been up all the way since 2016, okay? And then now, which way is it headed? Well, it looks like it's headed down to me. So what are you saying, Howard? The last on the SPX for 10 bars in a row. Oh, are you saying greater than 10-day moving average? Well, let's count that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Are you saying the close or the lows? The last. You mean the close? Yeah, so we're above the 50 day moving average. Gary Kaltbaum calls the trading between the 50 and the 200 no man's land. And I think he's got a point there. So it's kind of just that's where market's sort of finding its way. When the when you have to death cross and it's below the 50, especially if you have daylight, Landry light, you could say, well, we're in a downtrend. When it gets above the 50, but still below the 200, eh, that's kind of a kind of a dangerous place to trade. And you know, what's weird is, or cool, I should say, is a lot of technicals, technicals come together. So, okay, well, between the 50 and 200, it's kind of a choppy, no man's land kind of place, quoting Gary. Well, lo and behold, we got a lot of trading that happened there in October and November. October. I sound like I'm on a tuna boat. <laughs> What's the guy on YouTube that makes fun of the commercials? What's that guy's name? He makes fun of the Chevy commercials. It's freaking hilarious. He's got like a South Philly accent. Anyway, back in October, you got a lot of trading to get through still. And guess what? You're in that no man's land. But yeah, I hear you. We're above the 50. So certainly improving. Not going to argue with that at all. Ulta. Ulta. Well, it's headed higher, obviously. And let's back the chart way out and see where we are. Okay. Now, this is going to seem a little counterintuitive, but you have a stock longer term. That's gone up about 800% or whatever the number is. Oh, we can measure it. Shoot, why not? Just doesn't have to be perfect. Oh, it's only 235%. Seems like it should be more than that. But anyway, it's had this incredible run in here. And we're in an overbought market. 
What I'm wondering is, can it sustain this? Now, forget about the structure, which we'll talk about in just one second. How long can it sustain that? Is it, is it priced for perfection? And here's the other sort of thing that comes with experience, and you'll eventually notice it yourself if you haven't been trading for a while. When you have a market that's kind of iffy, like we've had for a few months in here, and you have these stocks, especially at high, high levels that have defined gravity, and then the overall market starts getting better and better and better, sometimes these big these stocks that have done really well will become a source of funds meaning that funds will sell them to raise money to buy stocks at lower levels. And it's just kind of a, one of those perverse things that you just will see in time. So they could be priced for perfection. Now, let's just look at the actual technicals and not think too much. It's just breaking out past this prior high. It was kind of all over the place for quite a while. Kind of electrocardiogram, okay? Longer term, yeah, it's going up. But it's been electrocardiogram in here, and we're just beginning to break out. So for me to get excited, it would have to continue to break out and then look to play some pullbacks along the way. My only concern is now it's kind of priced for perfection, as I just said. And it'd be I'd be a little afraid to buy a stock like this, given the nature of this market. The 50-day MA represents intermediate term. The slope is down, but the price is higher. Well, yeah, with your, with your simple moving averages, obviously that's going to be a problem is that your lag is going to be pretty, pretty bad. Now, sometimes lag can keep you out of trouble too, okay? Sometimes you can say, well, this 50-day moving average is, headed, is still headed lower, so I better be careful and not get too bullish just yet. So that little bit of lag can be kind of like a whipsaw filter in and of itself. If you're looking at a 50-week moving average, though, I think it filters out even more noise. And especially if you're using Landry Light, can really help to keep you on the right side of the market. Yeah, short term, the moving averages are in proper order. Absolutely. Dow Long. Now, is this... Dell, like Dell computers. The first thing that I see here, when you first look at this chart, it's like, hey, you know what? That looks pretty good. And what does Dave say? With lots of caveats. But as a general statement, we do look to go out and buy IPOs at new highs. So is this an old company come public again? That's the first question you ask yourself. Getting back to the pure technicals, it's had a six-point run, which, don't get me wrong, is impressive. It's 14%, but for an IPO, you kind of want a lot of excitement. You might want a 40% run or something, something really exciting before getting into it. So it doesn't look bad. In a case like this, I wouldn't completely ignore it, but what I would do is wait to see if it can continue to follow through, maybe up to the 50s or so, pull back, and then look to play something like that. But... I hear you. It's certainly banging on new highs. You're welcome, Steve. Thank you for showing up. VVUS. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, thin, 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 though. Really thin. Where is my average volume? I seem to have lost it. But, yeah, it looks like it's a little bit on the thin side or a lot of it on the thin side. Yeah, it's got some volume here and there. Okay. Yeah, you've already had your, your pullback, though. And here's the only thing that, that's a little concerning is that you had this big wide range bar, and that's pretty much most of your trend right there, okay? Um, I think I'd leave it alone for now, but I certainly hear you. It's bottomed out. It's kind of interesting. Uh, 110 on the HV, a little bit more volatile stock. I know that QTT is volatile. Okay. Uh, Churchill Capital. Is that just a, you know, what is what do they do? Is it a capital company? I'm not sure what happened back here. But even with that gap here, okay, it's a, it's got an HV of 10. 
and this looks like a huge move here. It's only 6%. So it's just not enough excitement for me in an IPO. Now, when I talk about IPOs early in the stage like this, I'm framing it or looking at it through the lens of a pioneer type of setup. Do I want to get in this IPO as soon as possible? And in some cases, I am buying that new closing high, okay? But in a case like this, if it's a capital company, some sort of asset management or something, kind of hard for me to get excited about it. It really hasn't moved that far from a technical standpoint, even though the chart looks like it's gone a long ways. So I would wait for a secondary setup. By that, I mean let it rally and then maybe look to play some pullbacks along the way as opposed to trying to get in on these pioneer type of signals, meaning as early as possible. ESTC. Uh, this is an IPO, obviously. It's kind of an electrocardiogram. But, yeah, it's beginning to break, make new highs. I wouldn't be too excited to go in for a Pioneer from a Pioneer standpoint. When they're a little higher in price, I'm less excited about them from a Pioneer standpoint than when they're lower in price. But I, I hear you, and it's definitely interesting. I think in a case like this, what I would do is wait for pullbacks and play pullbacks along the way. But, yeah, it's definitely break it out. Keep it on your radar for now. L-A-I-X. Okay. I don't know what happened to my average volume, but let's see. Yeah, it's too thin. Yeah, it's really, really, really thin. And I'll get that fixed before next week. I wonder if it's in the black font or something. And if you want to see, is that the volume? Nope, that's optional. Huh. Okay. Uh, too thin. I'd uh, be really careful with that one. Just uh, way, way, way too thin. All right, anything else? Well, while we're in impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email at daviddavidlander.com. I'll cover it either directly in a week in charts or in the Q&A sessions. All right. Thanks, everybody. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. I really appreciate, again, you guys and girls being here. Thank you so much.